Barack Obama lashes out at U.S. intelligence officials over the botched airline bombing as he sets new air safety rules. But would these rules work at all? And will the so-called war on terror take a new turn? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Hood Abdel Hamid. Just about a week ago, on Christmas Day, a 23-year-old Nigerian man tried to blow up Northwest Airlines Flight 253. The flight heading from Amsterdam to Detroit had nearly 300 people on board. Omar Farouk Abdul Muttalab was allegedly trying to detonate a high-explosive device soon into his underwear. But he was overpowered just in time by passengers and crew, and the flight landed safely in Detroit. Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, which includes the Saudi and Yemeni branches of the group, has claimed responsibility for the attempt. Initial investigations into the foiled plot reveal a series of failings in the American security and intelligence systems. On Tuesday, U.S. President Obama said he has issued guidelines for a review of the intelligence system that led to the failure. When our government has information on a known extremist, and that information is not shared and acted upon as it should have been so that this extremist boards a plane with dangerous explosives that could have cost nearly 300 lives, a systemic failure has occurred. And I consider that totally unacceptable. Joining us today to discuss the issue, Simon Tisdall, assistant editor of The Guardian newspaper in the UK. He joins us from Bristol. From Stanford, Connecticut, we have Roger King, an airline and financial analyst at Credit Sites. And Steve Lott from the International Air Transport Association joins us from Washington, D.C. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Steve Lott, um, President Barack Obama was quite clear that there has been a systemic failure. Where exactly did the system fail? Well, I think it starts with the sharing of intelligence information and which we're concerned about as well as the U.S. government and governments around the world are collecting passenger information and uh, they have to go through, sort this information, find out who's flying. At the same time, they need to reconcile the what they call the watch list, the no-fly list. These are functions of governments around the world. And what happened, or what appears to have happened, according to the president, is that there was a breakdown in the sharing of intelligence information, which is obviously of great concern to us as well. Well, Roger King, does that will that put more pressure on airlines and airports? Well, I don't think it's going to put more pressure on airlines. The uh, security issues are now handled by various government bodies. And the airlines pretty much take, you know, uh, who's ever able to get through uh, security or customs. Um, you know, every time there's been a, you know, you know, a security issue like the shoe bomber or the mixing of chemicals, there's been changes in the you know, security procedures that affect how long it takes to get through s uh, security. But so far, the traveling public uh, has adapted to each of those. Okay, so uh, Steve Lott. Uh, you know, we have been adapting security according to uh, attempt, uh, attack attempts or uh, attacks uh, or real attacks. Now, is there something as 100% security? Is there any way to actually have preventive security rather than reactive security? Well, that's something that we've called for around the world as well, is that a lot of the things we've seen, whether it was reaction to the threat of liquid explosives or Richard Reed and the explosive in his shoe, a lot of it, as you said, has been reactive. We believe that uh, not only should we be looking for weapons, we also need to be looking for people that have bad intentions. So it's not just looking for tweezers and scissors and things like that in people's luggage. We really need to start looking for uh, some of these uh, folks that are, are looking to cause harm to airlines and interests around the world. So we believe that using intelligence can help in tracking down uh, terrorists before they even get to the airport. Well then, Roger King, would that lead to racial profiling? Well, you know, in this country, racial profiling is illegal. Um, the uh, the you know security checks are pretty much done on a you know you know random uh, basis, and if it's a if it's an if it's a grandmother or a young kid that happens to be that number that gets picked, they will frisk those people. So I don't I don't think that we're uh, we reached a point of racial profiling yet. 
you, you know, but when you, but it's not hard to connect the dots. Uh, most of these uh, people involved in these incidences are are uh, young males in their twenties, and they have some sort of you know like like religious you know fanatic uh, reason for for doing their actions. The question is, how do you determine which of the young males are religious fanatics? Okay, so let me bring uh, Simon Tisdale now into the conversation. Um, since this foiled attack, uh, we have ha heard from Barack Obama uh, criticism about uh, the way the uh, security and intelligence agencies are operating, the way they, they, la they don't share information. Isn't that the same kind of rhetoric we heard just after 9-11? Well, there are some uncomfortable similarities between uh, what happened on Christmas Day or nearly happened on Christmas Day and what's happened in the past. Um, it's notable, for instance, that the explosive uh, element that the uh, alleged bomber was carrying on Christmas Day was the same substance that the Richard Reed, the so-called shoe bomber, was carrying when he tried to blow up an airliner um, in 2000-2001. Um, I think the, uh, the, the recriminations that are now going on in Washington and elsewhere, including Britain, about whether security procedures were followed, whether security procedures were effective, whether information was available and should have been collated in the way the President Obama suggested. These are also very reminiscent of some of the investigations that followed the 9-11 attacks. Okay, well, so now what we are hearing is that there will be new security uh, measures, Steve Lott, such as forbidding uh, passengers to leave their seats an hour before landing. But is that, in that kind of security, does that lead to anything? I mean, if someone wants to carry out an attack, can't they leave their seats an hour and a half before the plane lands? Well, that's the big question, and, and we're seeing some of these rules and procedures literally change by hour by hour, day by day. There were some pretty strict and stringent rules and procedures that went into effect that the U.S. government put into effect for all international flights inbound to the United States immediately after the attempt on Christmas. Some of those have since been loosened. Right now, it's up to the pilot's discretion whether uh, he or she allows passengers to get up. There was uh, discussion about turning off uh, some of the parts of the in-flight entertainment system that show a moving map of where the aircraft is. So we're continuing to see some of these rules evolve and change. We expect more changes today, in fact. What those changes will be, nobody knows. Those are being discussed uh, among the government, among the intelligence community, and remains to be seen. What we've sent the message to government is that, look, you need to take into account how an airline operates, how an airport operates, and certainly we understand the need for emergency measures right after an attack, but some of these cannot become permanent, otherwise you'll bring the air transport system to a screeching halt. Well, Roger King, that's what I wanted to know. Uh, the, air, the airline uh, industry is already uh, under a lot of pressure and has incurred a lot of financial losses. Such uh, an event now, just as it was hoping to have a better year in 2010, is a huge setback, isn't it? Well, I don't think it's a huge uh, setback. The, the ongoing problems that the airline industry faces are, are, are the cost of, uh, of fuel and the gradual um, you know, the decline of the air traffic control systems, you know, around the world. As more and more planes fly, the system's getting more and more antiquated. Those are things that, that affect the airlines every day. Events like this are just uh, one, you know, pop-ups every couple of years. And then, and then everything seems to go back to uh, normal. You know, underlying, of course, is the, is the uh, fact that there's always the you know, exogenous you know, risk of terrorism anywhere in the world could affect people flying in the rest of the world. But so far, um, for the last several years, these, these are minor events, um, especially in terms of their outcome, and they haven't really affected the uh, flying of, of the uh, you know, flying demand. What they do affect is the length of lines that, you know, at the security checkpoints, those could be solved by having more checkpoints. And there's one other point I'd like to make is that uh, this individual apparently entered into the, uh, in the international air, you know, uh, air system in uh, Nigeria. And once you get past you know, a, a, you know, a security checkpoint anywhere in the world and get onto an international flight, you're really not checked again. Okay. So you know, that's probably one of the biggest weaknesses of the international air security right now is that people can enter the system 
from, uh, from the EU or Africa or the Middle East or Asia, any country, and, and once they're into what they call you know, secured airspace, they can fly to another hub and then, and then get onto a plane to the United States or Europe or, you know, or, or anywhere, and, they, and, they, and they're not rechecked. So I think that uh, one of the problems in, is, is not so much that, that various no, you know, fly lists were not uh, coordinated, but also you know, the fact that people, there are airports where people can get through security easier than other airports. And once they say hit, in this case, you know, Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam, they're all considered the same. Okay. Now, moving on, uh, Simon Tisdall, uh, the, this attack, uh, uh, this foil attack appears to be um, claimed by uh, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, and it comes uh, just two weeks after a U.S.-backed air raid on uh, alleged Al-Qaeda camps in, in Yemen. Uh, how much do you think the geopolitics, really, or the policies uh, of Barack Obama in Pakistan, in Yemen, do affect uh, this kind of, uh, do prompt this kind of attacks, may I say? Well, I think uh, uh, President Obama is asking a lot of questions of his own administration at the moment about who knew what and whether they should have acted differently. But I think some questions have to be asked of Obama himself. It does appear, though the administration hasn't confirmed all the details, that the United States military forces were involved in, supportive of, assisting in the Yemeni government's air raids on supposed al-Qaeda training camps um, to the northeast and south of Sana on December the 17th, about a week before the attempted blowing up of the Northwest Airlines flight. Um, these, air, these air raids were reportedly, according to one U.S. Um, television network, complemented by U.S. cruise missile strikes. Now, this hasn't been confirmed or denied by the White House. Um, but the Yemeni opposition f spokesmen and al-Qaeda outlets have, have claimed that um, many women and children were killed by these Yemeni stroke American attacks on December the 17th. And in the statement that they put out on Monday this week claiming responsibility for the attempt on Flight 253, they specifically referred to these attacks and said that the attempt on 253 was in revenge for what the Americans and the Yemeni government had done to their own women and children. The statement was carried on an al-Qaeda affiliated website. Now, um, I don't think Obama disputes that U.S. forces were in support of these operations, but he has not, or not, not nor his spokesman ever explained up to this point exactly the level and depth of American military involvement, whether cruise missiles were used, and whether indeed he, Obama, personally gave the order to attack or to, to the U.S. military to get involved. Because if he did, then that suggests that he himself may have actually triggered the attack on Northwest 253, which of course may have been in the pipeline, may have been about to happen anyway, but actually may have not have gone ahead when it did, but for American military actions. I think that's one big question. More broadly, you mentioned Pakistan and Afghanistan. Well, yes, since he's, be since he's been in office, Obama has been quite willing to use U.S. military force, particularly predator drone aircraft, for attacks on um, claimed Taliban and al-Qaeda targets on both sides of the Afghan-Pakistan border. In many cases, reports say civilians have been killed. These drone attacks have become incredibly unpopular in Pakistan, where there is very now a very strong swell swelling of anti-American sentiment, which does not help with the overall objectives of the war on terror. Uh, Obama's also been quite prepared to use military action elsewhere. Um, you may recall the rescuing of an American captain who was seized by Somali pilots, pirates and the killing of two or three of them by American special forces, another operation ordered by Obama. So he's not, not shown himself at all loath to get involved militarily and in terms of covert military action um, in some of these combat areas. But I think legitimate questions have to be asked about the consequences of those American actions. Well, in the wake of the 9-11 attacks in 2001, the then U.S. President George Bush started the so-called war, war on terror. President Barack Obama continued and in certain alleged hotspots intensified the fight against extremism. Since taking office, Obama has added more than 50,000 troops in Afghanistan, 
Across the border, the U.S. has been stepping up pressure on Pakistani authorities to increase the offensive against terrorist suspects. Washington has also increased its military relationship with Yemen over the past year. And last week, two U.S.-backed air strikes in Yemen reportedly killed 30 militants, including two senior members of al-Qaeda, but innocent civilians were also killed or wounded in the raids. Uh, Roger King, uh, Al-Qaeda, when it issued a statement uh, claiming responsibility for the foiled attack, actually boasted the fact that it can uh, go around any security measures that the uh, American security and intelligence uh, officers take. So where does that leave, really, the whole concept of improved security since 2001? Well, the... There's, a, there's always cracks in the system, and apparently getting on a plane in Nigeria uh, is one of them. But I think this whole concept of that, um, that these extremists are attacking planes coming to this, to this area just because, um, just because of drones and uh, actions against uh, pirates, I think that's all rubbish. I think these people do it anyways. They'll continue to do it. And uh, there's, there's thousands of people out there you know, attacking ships in the in the Arabian Gulf and the Red Sea. Um, there's people killing people everywhere around the world, and um, and just because we're trying to you know, stop some of them doesn't mean that we're ex, you know extra targeted. I think all these terrorist attacks will be happening anyways. It's not a retaliation. It's a religious you know, fanatics. Simon Tuzil, do you agree that these attacks would happen anyway? No, I don't. I don't think they come from nowhere. I think they are a response to a whole series of actions by the United States and by Britain and other, other major powers around the world which go back, which have created a sense of injustice and uh, exclusion that goes back decades, maybe centuries even. But it's nonsense to say that, um, that the drone attacks on Pakistani territory which, which kill civilian people do not create a very strong reaction in Pakistan and throughout the Arab and Muslim world. Of course they do and make the objectives of the war on terror much harder. I mean, the United States military forces appear to have been complicit in killing a large number of civilians, including women and children, in Yemen on December the 17th. Mm -hmm. This has hardly been reported in the Western press. Now we have a major terrorist incident which is directly linked to the activities of uh, the same people that the Americans were attacking in Yemen on December the 17th. And to say there's no connection between the two is absurd. Of course there is a cause and effect here and um, that goes for the Afghan pack theatre and also goes for what happened in Iraq, although luckily most of that's now subsided. And, and uh, Steve Lott, these images of uh, people, uh, civilians dying, have angered many people uh, in certain areas of the world and have actually made some argue, pushed uh, attackers at becoming very creative in the way they try uh, to carry out a, a plot. Now, in the view of that, how far can security go? Where, where can it reach? I mean, a lot of people are asking this question, how far can it go? And that's the big question. You're absolutely right, is how far can it go in terms of the information that we collect from passengers, and how far can it go in terms of the technology that we use? And that's what we're going to have to have uh, really a good analysis of going forward. Certainly, we need to look back and see what went wrong in this incident, but also we're telling the government that you really need to do a rethink of how we do security going forward. Uh, we need to do an analysis of how information is shared, and we, re we need to rethink on how we do security screening at the airport. Security screening at the airport, for the most part, has not changed in a good 20 to 30 years. We're still doing the same things we did in the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, we certainly are you saying it hasn't, technology. I'm sorry, are you saying it hasn't changed even after 9-11? Well, it, it, it changed in that uh, there's new restrictions in terms of what happens on the aircraft. We've hardened cockpit doors. We've done a lot. I'm speaking specifically to the screening at the, the airport. Really, when you think about it, you still go through the x-ray machine. You still go through the, uh, the magnetometer. We now take out liquids and gels. You take out your... Uh, you take off your shoes, but in general, the system itself, for the most part, is has not changed a whole lot. So w what we're saying is we need to 
make bring some of this technology from the lab to the airport much faster than we're doing today and we need to think about how the whole system works Th there's a lot of discussion about these whole body scanners whole body scanners have been around since 1995 this is not new breaking technology what's been the issue is there's been a lot of privacy concerns there are a lot of countries around the world that actually have laws and regulations concerning privacy that wouldn't allow whole body scanners to be uh, installed in airports. So again, I think a lot of these issues are going to come to the surface, how we collect information, how we do scanning and screening, and obviously the privacy concerns as well. And Roger King, um, considering that they are uh, that the security, as you said earlier, has to be on both ends, uh, from the departing country to the uh, arrival country. How is the U.S. going to be able to convince certain governments who maybe don't agree with its policies around the world to take part in this effort? Well, see, that's 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 probably you know the the real issue. Uh, it's it's hard for us in this particular case with the um, Christmas Day flight. It's hard for us to tell the people in Amsterdam, well, uh, you have to recheck everybody from these certain you know, countries because their you know, security isn't good or it, it, you know, it's proven not to be good. And yet these other countries, their security is okay. You know, there's, there's significant you know, political issues uh, since the actual security for incoming flights is handled uh, in, you know, on other continents. Okay, and Simon Tizzle, uh, as we see uh, the uh, in the new year, the, the 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 war continuing in Afghanistan, more U.S. involvement in Yemen. How serious are we to take the the promises of Al Qaeda to to carry out more attacks? Well, for those who've been watching the situation in Yemen, um, there is no surprise in the, in the recent events um, in the sense that they have been publicly threatening for some months, if not for most of, the, of this year, uh, to, to carry out attacks on, on the crusader countries, as they call them, on Western unbelievers, that's people like me and my children, and anybody who happens to live in Western Europe or America who doesn't agree with their views. I mean, they are a common enemy. There's no difference between me and my American colleagues there on this one. The question is, how, how do you go about dealing with this uh, menace? And um, I would suspect that if the attack on Flight 253, God forgive us, had actually succeeded on Christmas Day, you'd have been looking at uh, probably an overt US allied military intervention in Yemen right now, which is exactly what happened after a, after 9-11. Um, luckily that attack did not succeed, but the idea that therefore everything's okay, of course, is not the case. Um, I think we'll be looking at stepped up military, US military, British and others involvement in Yemen. Um, Britain's already providing a lot of assistance and aid to that government, so is the United States. I see, I think there'll be more economic, financial, security and military involvement there. Um, as they try to root out these uh, reconcentrations of al-Qaeda figures and sympathetic jihadis, who, many of whom seem to have moved there from the Afghan-Pakistan -Pak border, displaced by American and allied military pressure there. I think um, we're looking at quite another serious year of trying to stem, fight off terrorist attacks. And, and I do think that increased Western involvement in Muslim countries in those countries will produce an adverse reaction, will lead to greater anger among indigenous populations, will lead to the radicalization of more young Muslims opposed to the West for the wrong reasons, I would say, but um, also it gives more cannon fodder to Al-Qaeda. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. We have reached the end of the program. And thank you so much for joining us here on this edition of Inside Story. We welcome your comments and suggestions. Please email them to us at insidestory at aljazeera.net. Goodbye for now.